So you missed your standing ovation. <laughs> there was a really great standing ovation for this crowd. And in that, I'd like to actually begin by asking, I know that I met a lot of people who have been water protectors. If there's any water protectors in the audience, can you please stand up? I'm kind of curious, does the rest of the crowd not drink water? <laughs> <laughs> things to cover and so I'd like to kind of start where you'd like to start with. You begin with asking the audience to consider this as a visual legal experience. A visual legal narrative. Excellent. Thank you. And can you, now that they've seen that, is there anything you'd like for them specifically to think about or? Well, I just want to really Thank you all for, for just coming and from here you're gonna share this story because this the battle is still is still going. But um, I know Michelle from a legal perspective. This is this is I'll let her answer that. From my perspective, it was something for the attorneys to carry over. And I'm hoping that I did that. I'm hoping that I shared enough evidence in human rights and constitutional violations, which now we're seeing in in the court as a the due process violations, and I'll let Michelle um, add on to that. Water protectors are still in an incredibly precarious situation. Yesterday, Vanessa Dundon, who was one of the victims of the night that the police sprayed water protectors mm. with water cannons and sub-zero temperatures, her court case is ongoing. Chase Iron Eyes, his court case is ongoing. Holy Elk, Lafferty, her court case is ongoing. There are many, many, many water protectors who still need your help and your support of their legal defense. You can look up Water Protector Legal Collective um, online to um, support them. Um, in addition to this, there is also a, a divestment campaign which is happening right now, which is also indigenous led by mazaskatox.org. So there's lots to be done, but right now the, um, the fight certainly is not over for each and every water protector who is still facing criminal charges for doing nothing more than protecting their treaty land and protecting the water that is sacred to each and every one of us. We should be supporting them with all the resources that we possibly can for the stand that they made, not only for Indian country, but for the United States of America and the world. They are truly our heroes in the contemporary times and we salute them for their bravery that they showed on the front lines, as well as for our brother here and many others who were able to go to great lengths to provide this type of documentation to you. There has been incredible um, state uh, police repression as a result of the Dakota Access Pipeline. Um, there is still denial in this world among decision makers that the human rights abuses even happened. When we go to um, the banks in Europe, we are still trying to plead the case that there was human rights that abuses that occurred and that divestment from these companies is necessary and immediately urgent. Um, so there is still so much work to be done um, in regards to this encounter of indigenous peoples fighting for justice and for self-determination of their lands and their futures. Thank you. When I talk to a lot of non-natives in Tucson, I get the question, what is treaty land? That people don't understand um, that. Believe it or not, in Arizona, of our 22 tribes, only one has treaty. The rest of the tribal lands here were established by executive order. So that's not something as um, Arizonans is this common language. Would you mind explaining to the audience what treaty land is? The United States 
United States is a really a new nation. Indigenous peoples have been living here since time immemorial. And part of our history here in the United States are these international treaties that were created between all of our ancestors, both the indigenous ancestors and our brothers and sisters who came from across the sea. Those treaties were born from conflict and born to prevent situations like Standing Rock, to create and nurture peace within our very multicultural society. Um, indigenous peoples, we hold those treaties as sacred agreements, as legal contracts that are living, that define the rights and obligations between our indigenous peoples and the United States government. Treaties are, in Article 6 of the Constitution, supposed to be supreme law of the land, federal law, supreme law. However, we still continue to have problems with the United States government honoring those treaties and those very basic fundamental human rights that indigenous peoples have a right to property that cannot be extinguished, that indigenous peoples have the right to their governments, that they have a right to their legal systems, and that they have a right to self-determination. This is what the treaty tradition of the United States should be. Um, right now, we are still as indigenous peoples fighting to have those treaties honored. And in the case of the Dakota Access Pipeline, we had a very clear uh, violation of the treaty on lands that have never been ceded, that have never been given to the United States government by the Ocheti Shakoe, by the indigenous peoples who signed the Fort Laramie Treaty of 1851 and 1865. Um, uh, Thank you. So Myron, you have been touring like a madman. And I'm taking a deep breath for you. There's a lot of work you do with people when you come and you shoot this film. What's a major, major thing you would like this audience to understand about why you undertook this filmmaking process? First, seeing this was um, a repeated history. And the things that we had to battle out there from yellow journalism was very much real. And the history of uh, who controls the media controls the culture. And this uh, narrative, if this wasn't an indigenous led movement, it would have been a civil rights movement and things would have changed. And we would have been called protesters and not water protectors and the Dakota Access would have been able to justify their insurance, and Morton County would have been able to justify their uh, federal funding, which they need to incite a riot in order to get that. And they continue to incite a riot. As you can see, they're the ones that showed up that way. Being a part of the prayer was something to document and witness. Now you guys get to see that, what one nation, 400 nations that came, and allies around the world got to witness. And what I, I mean, it puzzles me around the country when I ask people if they know what's going on on that. I've seen a little bit on CNN or a little bit on nothing like what I show them about an Avenger with missile launchers up on the hill for the drones or Homeland Security hanging outside with a sniper or the Tiger Swan, the mercenaries that you guys, if you want to read that in the Intercept right now, who's trying to play victims. These are an international mercenary that's domestic and hired by the oil company. And also when you share with them that the Dakota Access just now gave a, a month ago, um, the state of North Dakota $15 million, which we just witnessed the second decade of the 21st century Pinkertons. So this is something that we all need to be aware. It's not just an indigenous issue, it's a human issue and it's gonna affect you. And as a, as a tribal member in exercising our inherent rights, that's also something that our allies got to witness. And so much more as a historical trauma trainer is I started to see a lot that our own that our <laughs> allies were hurting the um, the pain the embarrassment that they were witnessing the desecration of sacred sites that were being right in front of everybody the digging up right across the river and the the shame that I was shared 
with um, the anger. What, what, how can they do this? How come, how come they're doing this? And it's like, they're just finding out what it is to feel and to be indigenous. And when the Army Corps of Engineers would tell us something, we knew that was a lie automatically. And the easement, I knew it was a lie because my drone just got shot, documenting them bringing in the equipment. And I walked to that sacred fire when everyone was crying and they were laughing and excited. And I just, I didn't want to be the Debbie Downer. And it was really hard for me to walk away. And I just told my team, we got to go back to work. We left. And um, we were at it again that night, documenting again. And as a cultural monitor, protecting our sacred sites was really hard to watch because back home we have to deal with grave robbers, shovel bums, um, hobbyist archaeologists, defacing our, our, our petroglyphs way out in the middle of nowhere with the modern tools that you have. Jesus. So there's a lot that we have to fight in all four directions. But this is something that on another side is that we got to do in unity and solidarity. And we got to educate the world with some of the most educated people in Indian country that brought all their tools, their skills, their cultural knowledge, their medicines, their healing, their strength, and as well as our allies. And to witness 4,500 veterans come in and 550 churches come in and denounce the doctrine of discovery and acknowledge what that is. That's the first time I ever seen churches actually know what that meant and talk about the sexual abuse and apologize for the child molestation apologize for the rape and the murders, which I, as a trauma trainer, historical trauma trainer, I cried when, when I was being, when he was sharing that with me at the front line, because I work with youth all over the country with this. And so um, I, I shared with them, I said, well, brother, why don't you come to the front and pray? And he goes, well, we don't, we, don't, we don't get political. I said, well, either, we're praying. And he goes, well, well, I'll think about it. And then I saw him the next day, and he says, Myron, come here. And he lifted up his, uh, he had this big white robe on, and he lifted it up. And they had the attorney's number on the front, and they were heading to Bismarck to go pray for the, the governor. And they did go to jail. They did go to jail. And I don't know how long they stayed in there, but one guy did stay in there a little bit to prove he wanted to share a message that this wasn't okay. So, so many people stood together allies used the white privilege to stand in the front of indigenous people while they prayed and they said it to these officers and they locked armed locked arms together 50 of them and i thought i was in a twilight zone <laughs> when i heard none of our none of our indigenous brothers and sisters are going to jail today and because of our white privilege this is what we're going to do and i thought wow we, knew, we, we got a lot to share with each other in the healing process. And for you guys, I was able to witness so much of that beauty and to share with you guys is that healing was so important. And we're still hurting, we're still hurting. The um, PTSD that comes from people just watching and the um, people who are, they have this, this, this deep, deep um, hurt for not being able to get there or make it there. And to know that you you guys are all keyboard warriors and just being here and sharing the message, whether you like it or not, you know, that you're going to share this message. Thank you. I know that this was 